graciously invited, so call me back. Okay, I love you. What's up, you guys, and welcome back to another episode of Emotionally Online, your weekly slumber party for spilling guts and sharing secrets, hosted by yours truly, the one and only Maddie Drosbeck. How are we doing? How are we feeling? I'm recording this episode on Friday night, so we're fresh off Casa More Week, Love Island, and I have so much to say. I'm going to save it for the end of the episode. Don't worry. We have other things to talk about first, but goddamn, do we have... Do we have a week to review for Love Island? I have like four pages of notes in my phone. It's not even funny. I wrote an essay. So this episode is definitely going to be majority Casa more talk because we have had a royal week of reality TV. <laughs> yes, we fucking have. And now I'm just about ready to celebrate what a week it has been on a beach in the Caribbean. That's where I'm going tomorrow. Ooh, I'm going on vacation, which is why I'm filming this episode so early. When you guys are listening to the episode, I will be somewhere warm. Right now, it is like super rainy and windy in New York. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's like whistling outside my window as I'm recording this. It's crazy out there, vibes. Quick check in for the vibes. I've actually had kind of an amazing week, dare I say. It was Valentine's Day week. Um, I had a great Valentine's Day. My mom sent me this delicioso cheesecake that I ate by myself. I was sitting at my dining room table. I watched Love Island while I watched, ate the cheesecake. I ordered pasta. And then I laid in bed and I watched Palm Springs, that Andy Samberg movie that was actually so cute. I kind of fucking loved it. Also, I'm back in my movie era in general. I'm trying to watch hella movies this year. Honestly, I've been doing well. Let me, I'll read to you all the movies that I've watched this year so far. (laughs) Not like any of you care. Yes, you do. You care deeply about all the movies I've watched. (laughs) So I watched five in January and then I've already watched five in February and I'm going on a plane tomorrow. So I'll watch like probably only have time for one movie on the plane, but then I'll also watch another one on the way back. I'm going to be watching so many. You're not even going to know what to do with me. All of a sudden, I'm going to have all this knowledge. (laughs) I'm going to, all of a sudden, I'm going to be able to recognize male actors. It'll be like night and day. I'll be a new woman. Okay. This is all for trivia. This is, that's all I care about is being good at trivia. Just soaking up as much, as many thoughts as I can about pop culture. So this month I watched Nope and The Menu, both on a plane, which they're not great movies to watch on planes, particularly The Menu. When I was watching, first of all, I loved it. Second of all, it's an awful movie to watch on a plane because the entire time I'm looking behind me, like worried that a child is like gl- glancing over at my screen. If it's adults behind me, I'm like, whatever. You guys can deal with it. It's a little blood, <sighs> whatever. <laughs> You're in public. Look away. Shield your eyes. But I kept like, you know, there's some graphic scenes in The Menu. Like, I'm, I won't spoil it. But it's, you know. It's a good fucking movie and there's definitely some blood, definitely some like shield your eyes type scenes, but I like didn't want to look behind me. So I was trying to look in the reflection of the screen to see like, is there a kid in any of the rows that can see this screen right now? Cause I was like, damn, I'm so sorry to that child if there is, but I'm pretty sure it was just adults. I looked when I was getting off the plane and was like, did I ruin any kids childhood? No, I think we're good. But honestly, Moments like that just make me think of the the bits of television that I saw when I was a kid that like stuck in my brain forever and how like actually G-rated those things were. Like as a kid, everything is scary. Like the two things that come to my mind, well, there's many things, but these are the two things that immediately come to my mind when I think of things that scared me as a kid. I'll think of three actually three off top and they're all Nickelodeon shows. Number one, the episode of the Amanda show in Moody's point when the dad, Moody's point was the one where like the mom was up in a hot air balloon. I, I, these details are escaping me, but I just remember there's one episode in the, in the Amanda show of Moody's point where the dad, for some reason, cuts off his toe 
I believe it was an accident. I'm not sure. But then some guy like steals it and he's like sitting on the side of the road playing with the severed toe. Do you remember that? Like that was traumatizing to me as a child watching fucking the Amanda show, just trying to have a good time, trying to have a little laugh. That was like a children's SNL, was it not? <laughs> just trying to have a little giggle. And then I'm watching like a a guy play with a severed toe and I'm supposed to think that's funny. That's fucking terrifying. <laughs> and then obviously number two, Mr. Meaty, whatever fucking abomination that was, that still scares me, to be honest. I don't know why it's it's not claymation it's that specific claymation that they did is it even claymation I guess I don't know whatever they are they're awful they're ugly I hate them and they're just I can't even think about it and then the third thing that used to scare me is the it was the Halloween episode of all that I don't remember which Halloween episode it was. I'm sure there were multiple, but I, I wasn't really a big all that fan as a kid. I think all that was maybe like just a little bit older than I was. I, I know a lot of kids my age probably did watch all that, but I, I remember my cousins watching it and I would sort of like, and I would sort of, you know, catch a glimpse or two. I'm pretty sure it came on right after one of the shows that I watched so sometimes I would watch a little bit, but I'm pretty sure my first exposure to all that was the Halloween episode and it just freaked me the fuck out. So I abandoned watching it. So anyways, now whenever I'm like watching the fucking menu on the plane, I'm like, there better not be a child behind me because I was scared by so much less <laughs> when I was growing up. But honestly, I wonder if the internet has just like in a very fucked up way, sort of desensitized kids to super terrifying shit because the shit that I saw on Tumblr as a teenager, like sticks with me to this day, you know, just like doing your, your little scroll. You're just trying to reblog just girly things, photos, you know, a little bit of porn. And then you get served like literally a video of someone on aliving themselves. God, what a time that was. That's awful. So I don't know. I wonder if young kids, because they're so exposed to the internet, some way or the other get exposed to things like that now. So it's a little different from when I was a kid and Mr. Meaty was the scariest thing that I could possibly lay eyes upon, which honestly, fair. To this day, it's the scariest thing I can lay eyes upon. <laughs> um, and then besides those two movies, I watched You People, which is the new, what is it? It's Jonah Hill movie that's on Netflix and um it was fine I mean I thought it was kind of funny there were definitely some parts of it that I had a little chuckle at but most of it was like <laughs> it just wasn't very good <laughs> and then I watched The Guilty with the which is um Jake Gyllenhaal 2021 it's um about a 911 call and he's you never see the other people it's just him being the 911 operator I liked it actually I gave it three stars so clearly it wasn't like my favorite movie ever but I did like it and then I watched Palm Springs on Valentine's Day so I've been going well with the movies this month I got movie pass again I signed up for the beta test back in August and I just got off the wait list so I'm back in the movie pass wave and you can be a hater all you want, but I'm going to be out there watching movies. I'm trying to be a morning movie person this year. I'm trying to go to 10 a.m. movies by myself because those take the least amount of points on movie pass so I can maximize the amount of money I'm spending if I only go see morning movies with my movie pass. I'm getting in there. I'm getting thrifty with the movies this year. So anyways, that's what's been going on. Had a great little Valentine's Day. We had a great convo on the podcast last week. I had a YouTube video go live that I also really loved and was proud of. So all good things. And here we are. We get to sit here and talk about Casa more and read through some advice requests that you guys asked because this episode is going to be mostly cast on more. I figured that we could just dive into some recent advice requests because after all, this is a show for spilling guts and sharing secrets. So if you would like to spill your guts and share your secrets with me, you can do so via the submission box. It's in the 
that is, that's in the description of every single one of the YouTube videos and the Instagram, which is at Emotionally Online Pod. Share your stories, share your secrets. If you want to ask for advice, if you just want to brain dump, tell me about some drama that's going on, fill me in on the tea, whatever is going on. You do whatever you want in that submission box, baby. That What goes on in that submission box is between me, you, and God, and absolutely no one else. <laughs> so I pulled a few that have come in recently, and I figured we could just go through them, have a little chat, and then bop on over to Casa more because I'm going to talk for a very long time about that. <laughs> First up, I've got a very thought-provoking question. They say, hello, Maddie. I've heard you talk a little bit in past episodes slash videos about how it's not really in your life plan to have kids. I'm definitely the same, but I wondered if you find it hard to meet people in your dating life who are the same. Most of the men I've dated have been wanting kids, including a guy who was literally the best man I've ever met and showed up for me in so many ways, but he was intent on having kids within the next five years. I know he would be a great father, but I just couldn't force myself to want that. I'm now worried. I won't meet anyone who has the kindness and care that I really admired in him, but who is also child free. I thought this was a very interesting question because I just have had a very different experience. And I, this leads me to believe that the person submitting this is probably not living in a city or maybe you are. And we've just had very different experiences. But from my experience, most people in New York don't want kids. Or it's like mo most of the people in the dating pool are sort of like, eh, whatever. If it happens, it happens. Like nobody here is rushing to get married or have children. Like I feel like it is very far down the road if people are interested in that. It's like, you know, it's the difference between people who live in the suburbs get married so much sooner than people in cities do. I think children is very similar as well. So maybe some of the people that I have gone out with have been more interested in children than they maybe led on to me. Um, because it's so far out. I mean, honestly, to be totally upfront, it's not a conversation that comes up quite often because it feels so far away. Like I feel like a baby, to be honest. And I think that most other people do too on the child front, <laughs> like marriage feels so far away and the prospect of children also feels so far away. And I feel like that's a, a city thing in general. Um, so yeah, I don't, I do not think that anybody I've ever gone out with has actually explicitly said they want kids. I've definitely had conversations with a few people about not wanting kids, but the people that I didn't chat to about children, like I just sort of assumed that they weren't or that they were neutral about it because I'm, I'm quite neutral about it. I feel like my, I lean towards no, I don't really envision it for myself um, I've never like aspired to be a mother necessarily. Like people grow up their whole lives being like, I can't wait to have a family someday, be a mom, have kids. I've never felt that way. I can't wait to be an aunt. I love kids. Like I, there's nothing against them. I, I love little kiddos, little babies, but I just don't, I've never envisioned it for myself and my life. And I just don't know that I, I feel the need to, but I'm not opposed to it necessarily I think that like if I ended up with someone who really wanted kids and I believed that they would be a good father then I would highly highly consider it and if I was with someone like that and I accidentally got pregnant I might keep it I don't know it would be a, a game time decision for me but I think that's also part of it is like yeah, I definitely have met people that were like, no kids, don't want them for sure, no. But I feel like more often than not, I'm meeting people who like myself are like, I don't really see it, but like, who knows? Like people are just like, I don't know, like I haven't even met the right person. So how am I going to know if I want kids? Like that's the way that I see it where I'm like, I can't even, my brain can't even consider if children are on the table before I see the person that I'm going to be with. Like we can't even get there. Like I don't aspire to just have children and like pump them out. But if I ended up with someone who that was where our relationship went and I could see that, then I wouldn't be opposed to it. But it's just like, I can't, I don't want kids for the sake of having kids. 
But if I ended up in a relationship where that was a thing that I felt compelled to do, then fine. But if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to care about it. Anyways, <laughs> sort of going off track of what you asked here. Um, but yeah, I feel like the sort of answer here is probably going to depend entirely on where you're living. Um, because I'll tell you in New York, not a lot of people want kids <laughs> or it seems that way based on my dating experiences, based on my friends, based on, I mean, to be honest, I don't know a lot of people that are like, I am so excited to have children in the next five years. I think I probably know like two people that are like that. And both of them are in long-term relationships. I don't know any single people that are like, I want to have kids in the next five years. So maybe it is a location thing. My gut is telling me that you're probably in the suburbs. And so you're in a very different dating pool than I'm in. People have different priorities based on where you are. Um, so, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of people that intend on being child free um, that are kind and caring and, you know, soft, lovely people. But yeah, I'm, I'm assuming those people are harder to find if you're not in like a city or somewhere where children and marriage happen a little bit farther down the line, if at all. But they're definitely out there in, in mass amounts in my experience. So don't, don't lose hope on finding them. This person says, hi, Maddie. I've been binging so much of your content because they're so comforting and well-made. Thank you. That's very nice of you. It's really refreshing to see a content creator who has a high awareness of themselves and the creator industry. I have a question for you. As a self-employed person who mostly works alone, how can you tell if criticism, especially the ones you receive online, is truly constructive or just plain abusive? I don't know if this applies to a lot of self-employed people, but I've seen a lot of seasoned creators falling into this trap of blaming everything external instead of admitting that their content is unattractive, outdated, and no longer relatable. I've seen legit constructive comments, but creators would only respond in a passive aggressive manner. Can you shed some light on this? Where do you get your report on how to improve your work performance since you don't have the typical supervisors and bosses? Keep doing what you're doing, Maddie. I thought this was such an interesting question. There's like several questions in here, but I thought it was very thought provoking. So I wanted to answer it. Um, so I'm going to hit this in a couple different sections. So I'll start first up with your question of how can you tell if the criticism, especially the ones that you're receiving online, is truly constructive or just plain abusive? And I think that, I mean, it's a few things, but I think that overall, if you have an awareness of yourself, if you engage in like regular reflection and criticism of yourself, kind criticism of yourself, um, I think it's easy to differentiate between like good faith and bad faith criticism um, between people who like what you do, see you as a full human person who can be imperfect and a good person at the same time that might offer you criticism or feedback. Um, that's fine. I think you can tell the difference between when it's that and when it's someone that is like triggered by you in some way and is just taking out their own personal shit on you. It just within the way it's written within what it is. Like, I, I think there's a, a lot of things that sort of illuminate the difference between the two. I think that you can still have an emotional reaction to both. Like I'm not going to sit, sit here and say that I'm a perfect person and that I don't sometimes get, have a defensive reaction to good faith criticism about me. I think that sometimes like if you're not in the headspace to receive criticism and then you read something about yourself that you can sort of tell is true, but maybe you've never totally confronted it within yourself. You might have a reaction to it. I've definitely found that the good faith criticism that I get online is usually stuff that I criticize about myself as well, or it's, it's stuff that I, have already thought about. So I don't have any type of reaction to comments like that. Cause I'm like, word. Yeah, I agree. Actually, I've got to work on that. I've got to do this. Um, uh, but I have definitely had moments where maybe someone has called something out about me that I can tell is true, but I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like that. They clocked me on that. Or like I had never really thought too deep about it. And so maybe my gut reaction is to be like, uh, 
mean. I hate that. But like, give me an hour or two to get over myself and like get over my ego and I'll be able to sit there and be like, yeah, you know what? They're right. That's a fair criticism. Fair enough. I'm not perfect. That's fine. It's sometimes uncomfortable to be criticized, <laughs> but like, we'll get through that. It's fine. It, they, they meant it in a nice way. It's all with all the love in their heart that they are criticizing me. If they didn't give a fuck about me, they just wouldn't say anything. So I appreciate good faith criticism always, even if it takes me a minute to get there. Cause I'm a person who sometimes has an e- ego reaction to those things. Fine. Bad faith criticism is like a totally different feeling. It's when you read something and you feel misunderstood. You feel like, well, that's not fair. That's not true. Uh, the people that know me wouldn't say this about me. Like you are not saying that while also seeing me as a fully formed person who is capable of doing good and bad or making mistakes or whatever, you are just like mean. (laughs) You're just like bullying me. (laughs) <laughs> there's a difference, you know, between good and bad faith criticism. And I think it's usually easy to spot the difference between the two. Um, but I think in terms of like processing the two, the three things that I think have been helpful for me has been like one, giving myself time to sit with a comment if I'm having a reaction to it. So I can make sure that the reaction that I'm having isn't just a reaction from my ego being a little bit bruised and that it is actually like a, oh, your feelings are hurt because this is bad faith criticism and it doesn't have any truth to it. And so that is hurting your feelings because you're like, what the fuck? Why do people think this about me? Why does this one person think this about me? And um, the other two things I would say is therapy and having a like solid support group of friends and family that you can trust to be honest with you when you need them to be. I think that like I was pretty upfront about the fact that when I started going to therapy last year, a big reason for that was that I just didn't know how to deal with the influx of comments about myself, good and bad. It just like was overwhelming to have to read so many people's thoughts about me all the time. Um, And my experience on the internet has always been 99.9% good, but the 0.1% bad really would weigh on me. And I would very much take things to heart and like, it would, it would like overtake me. It wasn't like in the moment I could maybe logically know that like, this is one person that said this, this is not what everyone thinks of you. This is one person that has their own life that is maybe triggered by something you said that is taking their life out on you. Maybe they had a bad day, a bad week, whatever it is. I can like logically know that, but my emotional response to it would always just be like, oh my God, do, do people think this about me? Like, this isn't true. Like, that's not me. And I hate that anyone would look at me and feel that way or hate me for like, I just didn't want anyone to dislike me, to be honest. And I had a really hard time like sitting with and accepting the fact that this like handful of people weren't going to like me. And it's hard for it not to feel like bigger than it actually is. Like I can see that it's like one or two accounts, but it doesn't feel that way. And it sometimes would just feel like this wave of panic Um, that like, oh my God, like, am I living in a state of delusion? Can I not see myself? Like, can this stranger on the internet see me better than I can see myself? And I would be like panicking up and down, like, please guys, if there's something about me that's awful and I can't see it, I need you to tell me right now, you know, be saying this to my friends and my therapist, (laughs) my therapist would always be like, do you think that people who are actually fucked up reflect like that? (laughs) And I'd be like, word, (laughs) that's fair. She's like, do you think people that are actually awful people sit there and worry about if they're awful people? (laughs) I was like, good point. (laughs) So anyways, I think a lot of it is just like, give yourself time and you can tell the difference between the two. Um, And like having support from people around you and in therapy helps with the stuff that is just mean and unkind but usually if you just break it down yourself you can tell what is you know partially true comes from a good place and what is someone just like being mean to you an example that I've definitely brought up before on this channel and this is probably like one of the 
if not the most impacted I've ever been by a negative comment, but it was when the show came out, when Emotionally Online started, um, before the show had even started, the first episode hadn't even come out and I received like a big paragraph comment from somebody uh, criticizing the show before it came out. Um, and saying that they thought that I was, that I had basically changed and I was superficial now and I cared more about aesthetics than I did about like substance, which is clearly untrue. And I was so hurt by this comment because I had worked so hard on the launch of the show and here someone was uh, criticizing all of the beautiful work I did on the photo shoot and um, the, the the like launch of the little intro video that we did, like all, all the little cute things that I did for the launch. Somebody was mad that I did those things before they even saw the show. They didn't even wait to see if the show was going to be amazing and incredible and full of substance. They were just mad that like the artwork was beautiful and I made a 30 second video promoting the show that was just pretty, even though I did go to film school. And clearly, if you know anything about me, I'm very interested in aesthetics. Look at the home that I live in. Clearly, I love home decor, interior design. I love fashion. I went to film school. All of my videos have like pretty elements to them. Clearly, I care about visuals. I'm not just here to be like a talking head. I'm at the end of the day, like my, my passion as my whole life has been filmmaking, storytelling. Like I, I care about all of that anyways. But I thought that was so interesting because it was an example of like somebody who was just like dead set on criticizing me before they even had something to criticize. Like if they had waited until the show came out and waited, watched the first few episodes and said, yeah, this has absolutely no substance you're not speaking from the heart, you're boring, and they wanted to write me a nice little letter detailing all of those things, <laughs> then I would have read it. But here's the thing, they didn't do that. They saw the launch assets and made a bunch of assumptions about me and wrote me this really mean comment that was like full of bad faith criticism towards me. And I was so impacted by that back and forth. I was just like, that is so mean. Like you didn't even wait to criticize me. You didn't even wait to make sure that your criticism was correct before criticizing me. And I think that like, obviously seeing the way the show has gone over the last few months, I I think that obviously that criticism was wrong. That was incorrect. And I, I was so worried when I first read that comment that like, oh my God, do other people think this about me? Cause I, I knew it was wrong because I was the one working on the show. So I knew what I was doing and I knew what I was putting on the internet. And like, I also don't believe that anybody is like entitled to creators vulnerability online. I think that I share a lot because I'm comfortable sharing a lot, but like if there ever came a day where people were mad at me because I decided to keep certain things private or, you know, if anybody was like, you're not relatable enough because you don't share enough you're not vulnerable enough like you're you're so superficial because you won't tell us the specific details of the last man that you went out on a date with like that that's not okay <laughs> like there, there's boundaries here and I think that like you you might have like the initial emotional um, initial emotional reaction but I think after you take a step back and let yourself process you can clearly see what criticism is coming from a good place and what criticism is coming from a bad place. But I was really impacted by that comment. It was like two, three days that I was literally just sat on this couch crying because I was so upset that anyone thought that about me after I spent so many months working on this podcast. Um, but um, yeah, I think definitely, definitely leaning on my friends during that time and my therapist helped so much. Thank God I had a therapist during that time. Whew. Would have been very bad if I didn't. <laughs> um, so to sort of move into the second part of your question here, when you say, I've seen a lot of seasoned creators falling into this trap of blaming everything external instead of admitting that their content is unattractive, outdated, and no longer relatable. I actually hate the word relatable. And I, I don't know what... If, uh, situation or creator you're specifically referencing with this so I don't know if I would agree or not but I think 
a lot of the times, like, I don't know that those words are ever going to hit well with people like calling someone calling someone's creative work unattractive outdated and no longer relatable I just don't know if anyone is ever going to read that and be like open to hearing it not that I don't think it's true sometimes like I I definitely hear what you're saying but also there's a part of me that just thinks that like people can make whatever they want to make right like you as an audience member aren't required to stick around but they're also not required to continuously change their content to match your specific taste as a viewer. You know, like I think you're allowed to change and grow and the creator is also allowed to change and grow or not. They can stay the same forever. They can make the same little videos forever, even if sometimes it doesn't make sense. Like I I think the example that comes up for me as I'm reading this is like when you have like 30 year olds that are still making back to school content and you're like you're 30 why are you making back to school content <laughs> and you're like why yeah I, I get the criticism of like this is outdated this doesn't really suit you um I don't know that providing that criticism is gonna like resonate with creators like that because I think they know that's outdated but they're still doing it because it makes them money. So the motivation is not relatability to their former audience. The motivation is money. And some creators are like that. So I think that it's like, that's fine for them to be that way. But it's also fine for you as an audience member to say, I don't like this anymore, so I'm not going to watch it. But I don't know that like holding creators at gunpoint to relatability is ever going to work. Like I don't know that being like, you're not relatable anymore and therefore you're bad. Listen to me. Take this criticism. Like, I I just don't know if that's going to work. At the end of the day, like, people are going to do what they're going to do. People are going to make the content that they want to make. And if you don't like it, you don't have to watch it. But I don't know that we can demand creators change the content they're making if they just don't want to do anything different. You know? If people want to make back-to-school videos well into their 30s and 40s, like, that's their prerogative, I guess. I can't imagine how that would be fun to make. But if they like it, then, like, who are we to judge, I guess? I don't know. (laughs) And I think, like, as far as where I get my report on how to improve my work performance, since I don't have the typical supervisors and bosses, it's a little different because it's creative. So it's, like, there's no right or wrong necessarily to this job. I think that I am very critical towards myself on the things that I create, sometimes to a fault, sometimes too much. Um, So I think that I'm always pushing myself to like improve and do better and like push myself creatively because I'm just, that's naturally who I am. Um, But it is sort of a little bit more abstract in creative fields, right? Like Obviously, I take feedback from my audience, learning things video to video, podcast to podcast. I get feedback from my friends and other creative people that I admire. Um, But yeah, a lot of it is subjective since it's just like, it's creative. So it's like, well, not everyone's going to like it. But if I like it and I feel proud of it, then that's really all that matters. Um And I guess some people want to look at analytics to judge their content success, but I, I don't think that numbers and creative go, go together like that. I think that like you can make the best video of your life and it can still tank numbers wise. Like one of my, several of my favorite videos that I made last year are actually like some of the lower performing videos that I had last year. I think that the video I made in October about, uh, all, all, all the things I learned in therapy that past year. And then in November where I made a video about the dinner party that I was throwing from my best friends in November, neither of those videos performed the way that I wanted them to. And those are two of my favorite videos that I've ever made. I felt so proud of both of those videos and the numbers definitely didn't reflect the way that I felt about the video, but I think it'd be so stupid to look at myself and be like, you're doing bad change (laughs) stop doing the things you like to do because the numbers aren't there 
So I don't know. I, I think that my feedback mostly comes from myself and just like pushing myself creatively to always improve and do the next thing that inspires me and sort of chase that feeling. But yeah, it's different. The feedback loop definitely looks different as a creative person in general and being a self-employed creative person on top of that and being someone whose creative work is their life. (laughs) You know, my, my creative work is my life. This is what I'm talking about. It's my feelings. It's my, my, my dating experiences. It's the clothes that I'm wearing. It's everything going on around me. So it's, it's, um, it's a different one that it is. So we only got through two advice columns, questions, but I feel like I've got to pop over to Casa more because we've got so much to talk about. So I'm sorry we only got to two. Apparently we had a lot to say, but um, yeah, we've got to get in there and talk about the Islanders. <laughs> One thing we're not taking any more criticism on is my British accent, which I understand is not a British accent. It's not lost on me that there are many different kinds of British accents and there's no, there's not really a British, I get it. I understand, all right? But we can't be getting specific. I can't be trying to focus on the specific regional accents, all right? We, that's the next level. That's the next step. We haven't even gotten there yet, babes, all right? We're just trying to to figure out, figure, figure out the mouth movements and the way that they talk with specific words. I think I've got it with some words, but then there's other words that I just can't, I can't say it. Like got, got, I struggle with. I definitely struggle with saying the word got. I think I'm doing a good right now though. Got. (laughs) So listen, we're having fun and we're, we're getting a little goofy and we're having a laugh. And if you've got criticism for me, British accent, will you take an elsewhere, babes? There's no criticism allowed for my accent in the comment sections. You tell me it sounds great or you shut your trap. <laughs> you tell me it sounds fantastic or you hush up. And you know what? If you'd like to send me videos, send me audio messages on Instagram of you doing your best American accent. And I'll tell you it's great, even if it sucks. So it's a nice little handoff. All we do is compliment each other. No criticisms allowed when talking about the British accents, all right? I know that my accent is fantastic. You don't need to tell me, babes. I know. I'm working on it night and day over here. So anyways, all of that to say, the Islanders are back in the villa, mate. And this week, they were in two separate villas because we was in Casa Amor. Whenever I start doing one of these segments, I'm always like, what do you think my neighbors think my job is? Like, what do you think they've heard? And how confusing do you think it is? Do you think that they watch Love Island too? Oh my God, what if one of my neighbors is listening to this podcast right now? Imagine, that would be so weird if I was your neighbor and I just whispered that in your ear. <laughs> okay, before I even get into my notes for this week, which I have so many, I just have to say that one Domino's ad that they play every time <laughs> that Love Island is airing, I can't get out of me head. Every time I hear it, I walk around my house going, Zominos. <laughs> Because it is crazy the way they say that word. Zominos sponsors ITV Hub. <laughs> it is so funny. Zominos. Like, why is there a Z in there? <laughs> Zominos. Anyways. Zominos sponsors emotionally online podcast. Just kidding. Zominos. <laughs> Zominos. Okay, we're done. We're done. But I just had to say it one more time. Okay. <laughs> Week five. We made it. And it's fucking Casa Amor, babe. 
Uy, 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 uy. When I tell you I was sweating, this week was crazy. So before I'm even going to get into this, let me read to you what my predictions were. Because I wrote on a little piece of paper, it's over there, but I did send it via text to my friends. So let me... Let me tell you what my initial predictions were. This was my will they cheat prediction sheet. Jesse, no. Will, no. Tanya, yes. Shaq, no. Lana, no. Ron, yes. Sammy, no. Tom, yes. Claudia, yes. Casey, no. Olivia, no. Kai, yes that means anything to you soak it in I was correct for about half a little bit more than half I was correct on and I was wrong for about half of those predictions which I can't even believe I was wrong for three of the guys and wrong for two of the girls (sighs) and that's all I'm gonna say so now it's time to dig in to the juice of this episode so Week five, we're starting. The boys arrive at Casa Moore first. We've got Frankie, Ryan, Bailey, Martin, Kane, and Maxwell. To be honest, I'm going to forget most of the Casa Amore Islanders' names. Sometimes I had no idea the differences between each of them. So bear with me because I might not remember who said some of these things. First night, they're going around, they're talking, doing a little chat, they're, you know, gauging what people's current situations are. Olivia forgets Kai's name, forgets Kai's name while they're talking, which I didn't understand what that was. Like, I obviously she didn't actually forget Kai's name, so I was like, was that like a flirting tactic? What was going on there? Um, the villas are also very close together, so they can hear everyone cheering, they can hear each other. At either villa. And that first day when they were sitting around talking about it and the girls were like powwowing about it afterwards, they all seemed relatively open, which I was shocked about because I was like, what is going on here? Like when they were all sitting around and they were like basically saying like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And they were like, it's better to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for for permission. And I was like, that is some man bullshit to say what's going on over here (laughs) it's like I I thought it was weird that on day one that's how they were acting because I was like there's no way y'all are gonna stick to that mindset once you go back and the people that you're partnered up with are with other people but I digress um the girls enter the villa the very next morning so the boys were there a night before next morning boys wake up and the girls enter we've got Layla Sanam Sammy Cynthia Linda and Lydia ask me if I know the difference between Layla Lydia and Lydia because I don't (laughs) why why do they all have five letter L names oh my god I think by the end of the week I knew the difference between them but like by then it's too late (laughs) you know what I mean like I'm it's like all of my notes I don't know if I'm specific so anyways The girls enter, and this is when the real mess starts to begin. First of all, Casey has given me the absolute ick. You know what? I'm done saying nice things about men on this podcast. I feel like I have said many a nice thing on this podcast about the men this season. I've said good things about Casey. I've said good things about Will. I've said good things about Shaq. And I just, I need to just stop, stop, stop doing that. Because Casey has given me the ick. Um, He's done that a couple different ways, but the first way that he did was they're giving the women like a tour around the villa. And so Casey is up on the terrace showing the girls like, oh, here's the view. And then some of the other boys are still downstairs so he can see them. And when the girls are walking back into the villa casey's like pretending to spank them being like oi, 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 whatever the fuck the boys do i was like ew that's so gross i literally wrote can you imagine if women did shit like that and i'm like no i actually can't 
because it's just so gross and weird. Like I hate, I hate when men do shit like that. And they're like the second a woman turns their back, they like look at their boys and they're like, ew, that's so gross, Casey. I actually fucking liked you. So people are talking, they're getting into it. Uh, Sammy, which I, to be honest with you, immediately right off the bat, I was not getting good vibes from the Casa girls. Sammy, especially who pulls Tom, who I'm number one Tom hater in the world. Don't get me wrong. But Sammy pulls Tom to like flirt with him or whatever, which bad taste 101. Why are you going for Tom? He's already been with like five different women in the span of a month. Sammy starts telling Tom that he needs to leave Sammy and get a real woman. This Sammy is saying that about the other Sammy. A real woman. First of all, if you are a woman yourself and you ever look at another woman and say that's not a real woman, you need to actually go put yourself in time out and think about what you've done. That is so fucked up and stupid anybody who uses the phrase real woman like go go in the corner and think because like you need to just sit down with your brain for a minute and squeeze it okay put it in the juicer we've got to get that out of there that's real bad what what the fuck do you mean real woman you need to be the real woman that's the path you want to go down do you really think think about it think about it at large do you think differentiating women as real women and not real women is going to bide well for you in the long run think about it because it's not what the fuck i hate when people say shit like that i'm like get get so serious right now tom needs a real woman if you need to dog on other women like that in order to get a man to like you you're not that fucking interesting i'm sorry i'm sorry if you need to look at tom and say you need a real woman instead of just like being a cool and interesting person and getting him to like you that way, like girl, you're just not that fucking interesting. That's so embarrassing. Hated that. We get to the kissing challenge, which is whatever, right? Kissing challenge does what it does. They all just kiss each other and then they all excuse it because it's in the challenge, whatever. After the challenge, this is still day one that the girls are in the villa with the boys. Will is having a conversation with, I believe, Layla. <laughs> I think. And it's getting quite flirty. He's having a conversation with her about kinks and sex and saying that he could have his head turned which I was in complete and utter shock when this was happening. I was like, Will, I trusted you. Oh my God. I thought that he was like a dorky little weirdo who wasn't going to behave like that. Boy, was I wrong. <laughs> this is, and you know what? I should know. I should know. I should have known that that's not how it was going to go. He got cast on Love Island. I, th I really thought they were going to cast like a dorky little weirdo who was going to like get this amazing stunner showstopper of a woman by sheer luck. <laughs> oh my God. Of course he's a douchebag. I was like, fuck, <laughs> you tricked me. You tricked me. You motherfucker. I thought you were cool. So day one, he's known this woman for mere hours. He has been seeing Jesse for about a month. They went to the hideaway. They had sex. It has been mere hours. And he is flirting with another woman and talking about how he could have his head turned, which is fucking crazy. Olivia also ends up kissing on like the first full day, which is like, wh what is going on there? I thought that she was a slow burner. What happened to that, babes? I thought it took fucking years for you to warm up to someone. And here you are kissing on day one. That was why in my prediction, I said that Olivia wasn't going to cheat because I was like, dude, it takes her so fucking long, which that's not me shading her. I think it's an appropriate amount of time outside of the villa. But in Love Island time, it's like, damn, she's taking 40 years. But that's why I was like, there's no way she's going to have her head turned. But day one, she was kissing Maxwell. Casey ended up kissing Sanam on day one and then Tanya was basically engaging in what most of us would consider foreplay it was worse 
than if she had just kissed him. She was flirting with Martin and uh, they were getting real weird, real weird and flirty real quick. And they're sitting alone in the kitchen area in Casa Amor, which is like separated from the rest of the house. So nobody is in the same place as them. Nobody can see them. And they're like cuddling with each other like arms around each other he has his arm like around her waist like right on her like butt slash hip and they're like she like pretends to like bite his nose she's like and like pretends to like bite his nose and then they're like kissing each other's shoulders it was very sensual I I was so uncomfortable I was like what the fuck Tanya this is worse than if you just kissed Martin and was like oh sorry I just fucking cheated on you with Martin a hands up Ooh, that is somehow not as bad as you engaging in literal fucking foreplay in the middle of a kitchen like what is going on <laughs> then Casey was having a conversation about um sex positions with someone I don't know but he said that he loves 69 and I just had to write who the fuck loves 69 like I just feel like anybody that has an appreciation for the art of oral sex doesn't like 69 because both people are not experiencing oral to the fullest extent. How can you focus on giving Olympic grade oral while also orgasming at the same time? If you can do both, you are not receiving Olympic grade oral. I'm telling you that right now, because if you are, there's no way you can do other things. If I'm getting Olympic grade oral, my whole body stops working. Like I can't do that. Okay. I don't want bad head. I want good head. Any lover of anybody who gives a fuck about the sanctity of oral sex does not like 69. So Casey saying that he loves 69. I was like, this guy sucks at giving head. (laughs) Sorry. It's just, I know, I know now if you love 69, it's because the girl does all the work. She puts in all the work of giving you Olympic grade head while you go limp because you're getting Olympic grade head. So, of course, you love 69. But I'd like to ask the girls that you have done 69 with if they love 69 because I'm willing to bet that 69 is not their favorite position. Next. <laughs> So then Will is up on the terrace with that girl that he was having the uh, kink conversation with earlier. And she's doing too much. She's doing way too much because she's telling Will that he's coming off boring and vanilla to the public and that he's not coming off cheeky at all, which is a lie. (laughs) I'm like, Will has very much come off like the fun little jokester of the season. So I couldn't understand why she was telling him like, no, you haven't come off that way at all. And then she was like, yeah, it just doesn't seem like you've totally been able to be yourself with Jesse. I was like, what, what is with these girls in Casa that feel like they have to like dog on the other women to get a leg up? Like, you know, the way you're saying isn't true. Like he has been super fun and outgoing and amazing with Jesse. How dare you sit there and say, it seems like you haven't been able to be yourself around her. We haven't really gotten to see this cheeky side of you. So anyways, that happened. But any, any empathy that I was going to have for Will went out the window when he decided to kiss her. I have never been more mad. And the fact that it was so quick and easy for him to make that decision too. Like he has been with Jesse for a month they have had sex Jessie is amazing she is such a catch like there was there was no reason for Will to turn his head away from Jessie at all there was no better option than the one that he already had he kisses the girl on the terrace and right after he kissed her as if it wasn't bad enough he goes playa Guys, I was sitting there like, I don't know. Like he just gave a masterclass in getting the ick. Cause what the fuck if I, oh my God, if I was ever, first of all, if I was ever dating someone and they kissed another woman and then afterwards was like, like thinking it was funny what they did. But also if I was 
the other woman in this situation if i was the girl that just got kissed by him knowing that he's been with a girl for a month he just kissed me and then he after kissing me is like play ya and giggling because it's so funny it's so funny to hurt women's feelings <laughs> and this is my beef with the men every fucking casa is if you're gonna be an asshole just do it just be an asshole it's it's the added like laughing and giggling and like broing it out after you've acted like that that I can't fucking deal with. It's it's the player. Oh yeah. Oy, oy, oy. I'm like shut the fuck up. It actually like it makes me homicidal. It it drives me up a wall. And then like immediately after Will goes downstairs, tells the boys, some of the boys that he kissed her and then was like, I think I regret it. And it's reinforced how much I do like Jesse, which is ridiculous. I don't understand how people in this show think they can get away with this when they're like, I had no idea I liked her until I cheated on her. (laughs) You guys are emotionally stunted. This is not okay. And it's like, why is Ron being the most loyal right now? Like, come the fuck on, Ron who was my Islander of the week because I had my money on the fact that Ron was going to keep Ronning, but apparently Ron decided that he was not going to be Ron anymore. Ron has turned over a new leaf. He is a loyal man now, but like what, what universe are we living in where Ron is the most loyal in the villa? Come the fuck on, which is also really fucking funny considering how much the boys were like on Ron about the way that he was treating Lana when Ron hasn't done what these boys just did, which is worse, in my opinion, Ron was having some conversations, which was bad. He was entertaining things that he should have been entertaining. But there's a difference between that and like full on cheating, which you guys had a problem with the way that Ron was suspecting Lana, but you guys are cool with doing whatever the fuck you're doing. You're all hypocrites. Like what the fuck is going on? Ron and Shaq end up sleeping outside. Next morning comes. Will is having a conversation with that girl. I'm like, I keep forgetting her name. I have to scroll up to the top of my, Layla, um, I think. Ron and Layla, not Ron, Will and Layla are having a conversation the next day. And Layla's basically like acting like she's feeling insecure. And she's definitely looking for reassurance from Will. Uh, Which is just like, what the fuck? You see that he's been dating someone for a month. He kisses you. You have this moment where I don't know why you would want him at this point when you see how serious he's been. Why the fuck would you want to be with someone who would cheat on their partner like that? If he'll cheat with you, he'll cheat on you. Like, let's be clear about one thing. And Lydia comes to him looking for, like, reassurance. And he's going on about how he's not a player and he's a one-girl type of guy. And I was like, you're not a player? Because last night after you kissed, you were like, play ya! Like, it was the funniest thing on earth. And now you're not a player and you're a one girl type of guy. Like, maybe consider that your perception of yourself is not rooted in reality. (laughs) Because what? that's not what happened. And another example of men being gross for no reason was when Kai was rubbing in the butt sunscreen like why can't you just be sexy about something without being like oi bro look at me to your boys like she gave you an opportunity to rub in sunscreen on her butt I forget who did this but Kai was rubbing in sunscreen to somebody's butt she asked him to do it all he had to do was be like real sensual with it but instead he looks over at his boys and is like get a load of these like spanks her and is like rubbing in the sunscreen and it's like why do you do that that is so unattractive like if I asked a guy to rub in my sunscreen on my butt and my thighs and he acted like that I would literally like get up and go home I'd be like excuse me no you could have been like cute and sexy with me but you chose to be like with your boys which is so unattractive to me it's not even funny it also just like makes me feel gross when they do that. Ugh. I think there was that was Sanam because Kai ended up kissing her shortly after who Casey also kissed her the day before. Tom kissed Lydia. Tanya and Martin are continuing to cringe me out with their like they're basically like a fucking in like broad daylight with their eyes. Then Tanya ends up kissing Martin. Full on snogging Martin, to be clear. Tanya can lie about this all she wants. We saw the tapes, babe. 
You were laying in bed, tongue deep with that motherfucker. So then we finally arrive at the recoupling episode. They open up this episode with playing Where's Your Head At, which was so fucking good. I was like, me and the Love Island editors are in alignment right now. Where's your head at? at? Where's your head at? I was having a good time. (sighs) Here we fucking go. So wake up that morning, Casa Moore. Tanya is sitting out with the girls and she tells them that she and Martin kissed and she immediately starts trying to downplay what it was. She was like, it was just a quick kiss in bed. Babe, no, it was not. We saw the video. It was a full on snog. Don't lie. You were making out with that man. You were tongue deep, baby. Listen, that was not a quick kiss. That was not a peck. Don't try to play it off like that. That is a lie. Just own what you did. You cheated on King Shaq. Be serious right now. And you know what? I love Shaq. I'll keep saying it. You know, that's the one man that I will continue to defend on this show. I fucking like Shaq. So Tawny's like definitely lying to the girls saying that it was just a quick kiss in bed when it absolutely wasn't. But honestly, they all looked horrified when she told them, which rightfully so. Her and Shaq had exchanged I love yous. They had also had sex. I think like the two couples that were far along in the process were Will and Jesse and Tanya and Shaq. So the fact that both of them had betrayals uh, was crazy because those were like the only two couples that really had a shot at being something solid. Everything else is still pretty new or has been rocky. Like Ron and Lana have been going for a while, but it's been like rocky the entire time. So the fact that Ron and Lana have both stayed loyal is like, we didn't see that fucking coming. Oh my God. Now they know the recoupling is coming. They're starting to have conversations. Boys are talking to each other about who they're going to pick. Tom starts being like, I feel like I have loyalties to Sammy, which would have been great to know yesterday before you kissed Lydia, which what is, I just, I'm going to say it again, but what the fuck is with these guys being like, yeah, I had no idea. I even liked her until I kissed someone else. Like, I just feel like that's bullshit. I feel like maybe that's like some hustlers university type shit that somebody somewhere along the line told you that you should use that excuse because it works. It doesn't fucking work. That's such a weird story that you would need to kiss someone else in order to know that you liked the person that you were with I think that's bullshit and I think that you need to stop using that excuse (sighs) recoupling time is here (laughs) it's the most wonderful time of the year (laughs) so we've got Casey going first Casey sticks with Claudia who also sticks with him Cynthia, which was the girl that Casey ended up getting close with, who I just, I didn't even say this, but literally the day before Cynthia was straddling Casey on the terrace, making out with him. So Cynthia was pretty confident that Casey was going to pick her. And after Claudia comes back in they're you know, they ask the questions of like, did you stay loyal? And then they ask the cast of girls, like, does anybody want to say anything? And Cynthia started saying like, yeah, like I straddled you on the terrace like literally yesterday, so I'm a little confused. And Claudia and Casey sort of like, she starts turning to talk to him and she was like, was it deep? Like, was it serious? And I don't know what Casey says, but Claudia like it giggles a little bit. And then the Casa girls were like, why are you laughing? What's funny? And then Claudia's like, I'm laughing about something else. Like, mind your business, whatever. whatever. So we're off to a really solid start here. <laughs> then Kai recouples with Sanam and then Olivia recouples with Maxwell. Olivia walks in like immediately trying to start a fight. She's throwing shade at Kai and is clearly pissed at him for recoupling, even though she did the same exact thing. So I was like, why can you really be mad at him when you guys just did the same exact thing to each other? And then she came off really insecure because she was saying it showed me what the public was seeing, like being away from you. It's like, why the fuck do you care what the public thinks? Like two days ago, you were both saying that you had never felt that way with someone before. Also, I feel like the public doesn't hate Kai. He's just fucking boring. Like if you're going to vote to pick which Islander you want to save, like who the fuck is picking Kai? He adds nothing to the show. Like I don't think people hate him because he's like a bad guy. He just gives us nothing. Okay. He's got the personality of a broomstick. 
So Olivia was like really angry at Kai. I mean, Kai was also being rude to Olivia. They were both being rude. And I was like, why are you guys even mad at each other? But the one thing I will give Olivia is that she said it's not between you and I to Sanam when Sanam had like chimed in and said something. And she's like, it's not between you and I. And I was like, listen, I'm not on Olivia's side, but I do kind of appreciate that she chose not to entertain beef with the new girl and like draw that line of being like, no, I'm going to be your friend. So you're not going to, it's not between you and me. I liked that. I thought that was good. Even though I don't really understand why they're fighting in the first place. Her and Kai, I mean. Um, Ron sticks with Lana, who also sticks with him, which we knew was going to happen. Tom sticks with Sammy, who also sticks with him. But, of course, Sammy is about to learn that he did not remain loyal, although he stuck with her. So the the host asks all of them, like, so did you do you think you stayed loyal when you were in Casa? And Sammy's like, yes, I did. And Tom is like... He evades the question in the same way that Casey evaded the question where he's like, you know, I was trying to explore. It's like, no, it's a yes or no question. Were you loyal or not? And the same thing that happened to Casey happened to Tom. He avoids the loyalty question. It gets passed over to the Casa girls and they're like ready to air it the fuck out as they should. And then so Sammy reacts to learning this information about Tom kissing Lydia to be like, I don't need a test to know how I feel about you like a normal fucking person normal people do not need tests they don't need to be tempted by cheating they don't need to cheat to know that they like you men in this show I swear to god they invented a test our relationship needs a test I need to cheat on you to know that I like you also like what's the deal with all this testing shit where they're like we needed a test and it's like well if you kissed you failed the test you failed it. What do you mean we needed a test? If the test was, here's a new girl, try not to cheat, you failed. But in their mind, the test is like, here's a new girl, go ahead and cheat. And if you still go back to the the original girl, you, you pass the test. And it's like, what fucking test do you guys, where'd you learn this from? That's not how tests work. <laughs> what the, what the fuck? They're so annoying. Um. Then as this is happening and like the, Casa girls are going back and forth with Tom about this. You can see Will in the shot stressing the fuck out because he knows that this is coming for him next. Because based on the ways that all this, based on the way all of these conversations are going, he's not getting away with this. And the girl that he kissed is the most vocal girl from Casa who's standing up for everyone else. So this is not going to be good for him. At this moment, I'm like, Will needs to be really fucking honest. He needs to do this differently than Casey and Tom just did. When it gets to him and they ask him the loyalty question, he has to say no. He needs to be totally fucking upfront about it. So (sighs) Jesse walks in. Will sticks and Jesse sticks. So Will's standing there alone, which is like the worst part of all of this because... Jessie now has this moment where she walks into the villa, sees him, and she gets to have this moment of thinking that everything is fine when everyone knows that it's not fine. And Will, in his, like, opening speech before they brought Jessie out, like, hinted that he was not loyal in Casa. So now all the girls that are already sitting around the fire pit know what's going on. So Jessie gets up there, and obviously she's super happy that Will is alone. And she literally is so happy she starts crying and goes, I knew I could trust you. And everyone in the fucking circle just cringes because they all know that Will cheated. Right now, Jessie is the only one that does not know that Will cheated on her. And she stands there and she goes, I knew I could trust you. Oh my God, I wanted to cry. It was too much. Then she sits down, she walks over to Will, she sits down and I think at this point, She's getting the vibes that like something is off. Like Will's acting a little weird. Everyone else is acting a little weird. And the host is like, are you happy? And she goes, I'm happy. And like, there's definitely a question mark at the end of that sentence. And then come the news. Will, when asked, did you remain loyal, immediately does own up to it and flat out says, no, I was not loyal, which I will give him points for. That's more than what the other boys did. Um, But then Will starts crying while he's apologizing, which 
listen, I don't want to criticize someone for like the, their emotional reaction when apologizing for something like this, but also it's hard for me not to be like, you're fucking crying. Like you made that decision and like, God, it's like, you shouldn't be crying. Jesse should be crying. And then of course, because he's crying, then Jesse feels the need to comfort him and be like, it's okay. It's okay. And then everyone in the circle like reaches over to comfort him. And I'm like, why, why are we doing that? Why are we not comforting Jesse? But she now has to like remain strong for a minute because he's just started sobbing, which I was like, I didn't like that. Um, but then at the end of all of that happening, Jesse, she's comforting Will and then she turns to Layla and is like, starts complimenting her and says like, you're such a beautiful girl. Like just fucking give her the 50 K she's winning. Jesse is winning. <laughs> like, I don't know how she's going to win, but she's going to win. Give her the 50 K. Like, I just don't, I don't think that anyone else is going to win at this point. She's the only one that I can see actually making it to the end. You mean to tell me that you think that Rana and Lana are going to win? No. I think that Jesse's the one that has to win after all of this. So then we have Shaq and Tanya. Oy. Shaq sticks with Tanya, like the king that he is. And Tanya recouples with Martin. Everyone is shocked. And I'm like, strap in everybody. So then Tanya and Martin are standing at the front of the, fire pit and Tanya starts trying to play it off being like Shaq and I have something amazing so I'm not surprised that he stayed loyal and it's like have something amazing what do you mean had because I don't know that this is gonna work after this and then Shaq is obviously really fucking hurt and is like I actually meant it when I said I love you but I guess some people say things that they don't mean and then Tanya starts going on yada 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 it's definitely not the end And then Shaq is like, well, it's the end for me. And I was like, fucking yeah, of course it is. What do you mean, Tanya? Like, this definitely isn't the end. Like, what, you just thought that you could cheat on Shaq? Bring another man into the villa and be like, my two boyfriends. (laughs) Like, I don't know. What did you think was going to happen? Did you think he was going to be down with it? And then Tanya starts trying to backtrack, being like, we haven't had any speed bumps. Like, it's been smooth sailing, which... How the fuck is Martin supposed to feel about that now that you're like, you know what? This is a speed bump. I'm coming back to you, Shaq. Like, why'd you bring him here? Why did you bring Martin to the main villa if you were just going to be like, yeah, well, that was a speed bump. I'm going back to King Shaq. Like, I just... What was the thought process? Now, King Shaq did have the king somewhat redacted when he followed up all of this by saying nice guys really do finish last, which why is that the second man this season that has pulled that line? You guys need to knock it off. That's really, it's very embarrassing when you say things like that. So for a brief moment, I was like, king redacted, but you know what? I'll give him the king title back just because I will accept that in a moment of heightened emotions, he had his nice guys finish last moment but if you ever say some stupid shit like that again uh the king title will be redacted for good Shaq. so just keep that in mind (laughs) the recoupling ends and right after they all stand up and start going to like hug each other tom goes up to hug jesse and like immediately starts trying to run defense for will all the boys do and they're like you know he's been feeling so awful about this he's so guilty and jesse was like basic she basically was like fuck off like i i this is like the one thing that is like just unacceptable for me like if he was gonna feel so bad about it like he shouldn't have done it like i actually don't care that he's been feeling so guilty and so awful like how do you think that i feel now i don't give a fuck that he's been sad about it he should feel sad about it like what the fuck And, um, good for her for telling them off like that, because I was kind of put off with the way all the boys like immediately started running defense for him. Like they weren't even really asking Jesse, like, how are you doing? And like letting her process her emotions and feel them. They were just immediately running defense for Will being like, oh, but he loves you so much. And she's like, shut the fuck up. I actually don't give a fuck how much he likes me. Clearly it wasn't that much. And then Tanya and the girls go sit somewhere and Tanya's like upset about, what Shaq said and she's like do you do you think that he really meant it and it's like why wouldn't he 
You were the one who came back recoupled. Like, I'm sorry, before you did that, what did you think was going to happen? Before you brought Martin back, were you sitting there like, yeah, Shaq's going to love this. <laughs> like, what? What do you mean? You guys exchanged I love yous and you thought that this was going to be cool. And then the girls that she's sitting with are not being serious with her. Well, granted, it is fucking Olivia. So Olivia's sitting there like, no, like people say crazy things in the heat of the moment. Like, just give him some time. Like, he doesn't mean that. And it's like uh, <laughs> crazy things. People say crazy things. Shaq didn't say anything crazy. He was reacting in a very reasonable manner. So I don't know what the fuck is going on there. Martin is mad at Tanya because she called him a speed bump, which I think is fair. All of like the the old significant other squash beef, <laughs> if, if any such beef existed. So Shaq and Martin, Olivia Sanam, Kai and Maxwell, all of conversations where they're like, I'm cool with you. I don't care. And um, Kai and Olivia end up having a chat. They are both still mad at each other for whatever reason. I like, I get Olivia's point of her being like, I didn't appreciate that you were like immediately over me. And Olivia was walking into the villa. Like I want to get to know Maxwell, but I also want to keep getting to know Kai. Like just cause she brought in Maxwell didn't mean that she stopped liking Kai, but Kai basically was like, I him now seeing Sanam and we have so much in common. We have similar backgrounds and it just made me realize all the things that you weren't, which is different than what Olivia is saying, but also it's like you recoupled. So you can't have the best of both worlds. Um, Tom is like straight up downplaying what he did to Sammy. Who's rightfully annoyed. Um, Jesse's crying in the bathroom to Lana saying he can't have liked me that much. And then will rounds the corner, right? As she's saying that. And I was like, what producer set that up? Because I hated that. <laughs> also, what I think is so funny is when Shaq is complaining about Tanya to the guys and being like, this is so awful. Why would you do that? And Will's like, yeah, she sucks. <laughs> and it's like, did you know that you are her and she is you and Will and Tanya are in the same boat of shitty people right now? Like, what is going on? <laughs> I'm sorry. Like I'm looking around like you're saying that. Like I, I feel like if you know that you have also done the same exact thing, it would maybe be wise to just sit quietly and nod your head, not be like, yeah, she sucks. <laughs> so then we have Tanya downplaying to Shaq how her and Martin were acting in Casa, which is understandable because she's been downplaying it to everybody and then also I don't know I don't understand why Tanya's acting like Shaq was a bad guy before Casa Moore like she's like I need to know you were gonna change your ways like you were annoyed with him like he wasn't a bad guy he hadn't done anything you were just annoyed with him why are you like acting like he had like some major character flaw that if he didn't fix it was gonna be like I don't know. I just felt like she was speaking to him like she was like, well, obviously I coupled up with Martin because I didn't know if you were going to change. And it's like, what? How, how are you finding ways to swing this so that it's not you being in the wrong here? Like you're just in the wrong. I, I felt weird about how little accountability Tanya was taking for the position that she put Shaq in. I was like, you're an asshole. Like you're just an asshole. Why are you so like desperately avoiding taking accountability for that so anyways end of the episode sammy jesse and claudia end up getting lunch with the casa girls and there's a lot of crying that happens they basically just run through exactly what happened from the girls perspective all of the kissing that happened the conversations the flirting all of that and there's a lot of crying and honestly i just feel so bad for jesse she was making me start tearing up because the way that she was crying just felt like so familiar to me where I was like, God, I have cried like that before. Like she, you can feel that she's been hurt before and that she has like trust issues. And she's like, how could you do this to me again? Like, how could you give me one more thing to like sit with and process? And I, I so desperately relate to that. Oh, it just, it feels like sickening. 
when people know when you're like close and intimate enough with people that they know the things that you are like insecure about or the things that have impacted you in the past, the trust issues that they have. And then they go ahead and do something that like makes them worse. And it's like, but you knew, you knew that someone had done that. Like, I just get that vibe from her that it's like, how could you do that to me? You knew, and you're supposed to care about me and you, have put me in this position where I'm feeling so awful. It's literally just like fucking horrible. And then while they're away on that lunch date, Tom is sitting by the pool talking to Casey and Olivia being like, I just hope she forgives me. Like it's so out of character for me. And I'm like, okay, but is it babe? Like you've been with like six girls. (laughs) in the last month is it out of character for you is it really is it really out of character for you tom like i just i don't know that it is i don't know that it is honey i don't know i just don't think that it is out of character (laughs) oh my god then the girls come back they start sitting around the fire pit having a conversation basically saying that like yeah they got closure but it wasn't good closure and that's the end of the week. That is fucking Castle More Week, baby. I fucking can't believe it. Crazy town, USA. I can't believe that Will was not loyal to Jesse. What a massive fucking fumble on his part. Like, truly, an astronomical fumble. So we'll be back getting into week six of Love Island next week. And, um, damn. I hope that it just keeps getting crazier. I can't imagine the aftermath from this lunch is not going to be insane. So looking forward to that. So with that, I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for hanging out with me. And I will see you next week. Bye.